Well, that was very impressive and also very instructive because basically the techniques which Dominic uses are the techniques which I'm going to be teaching you today with a few little wrinkles which have resulted from our research. But as you see, you could all, if you wish to do so, if you wanted to put in the time and the effort, develop a memory as powerful as, as Dominic's. Now, I mean, I think for most cases we wouldn't actually want to spend, I personally wouldn't want to spend 12 hours memorizing 54 packs of cards. Uh, but, you know, we all of us could do that if we wish to do so. So we're going to start off now and looking at some of the technical aspects of brain and memory. Essentially, this, this, these lectures are divided into two groups. The first few lectures are going to be looking at actually the techniques of the brain, how the brain operates, because I think it's important to have a theoretical background before you actually move on in the second half after the tea break or coffee break, which will be about 11 o'clock, to actually look at the practical techniques for, for using these skills. So let's just look at look at uh, the brain first of all, look at some brain facts. Uh, brain weighs on average about 1350 grams, 1350 grams. Uh, there's wide variation, the smallest brain, there used to be a, a, a sort of a fad in the 19th and early 12th, 20th century to collect the brains of famous men. Famous men and f a few women would donate their brains to medical science. And the smallest brain ever recorded of somebody who achieved great celebrity was that of the French uh, novelist Anatole France. And he had a, a very small brain, it was just over one kilogram, uh, but he, he was a highly intelligent man. The biggest brain ever found was of the uh, Russian author Turgenev, uh, and he had a brain weighing over two kilos. So you can see there's, there's quite wide variation. Uh, by volume, it's about 17 uh, 1,700 milliliters, about, of which about 1,400 is actually the brain matter itself. The rest is the blood and this is what is called the cerebrospinal fluid. This is the fluid which bathes the brain. Your brain is sitting up there in your skull, nicely protected by layers of membranes and bones and floating around in a very nice warm fluid. Uh, and it weighs about, it's about 2% of body weight, about the same actually weight as the liver. Uh, but it occupies around about 20% of the energy. 20% of all the energy you get from your food is going to go to feed your brain. The brain is very, very self-protective. It's got a lot of mechanisms which are designed to safeguard it from the dangers of the world. It's got what is called the blood-brain barrier, which prevents poisons, by and large, from entering your brain. If your brain is deprived from ox for oxygen or the oxygen level falls even slightly, you will faint. That's why... Uh, soldiers standing on parade on the parade ground will sometimes faint because they're not actually able to return the blood from their feet to their brain. This requires the action of what is called the muscle pump. This is the squeezing of the calf muscles on the veins to push the blood back to the heart. If you stand motionless, you lose the muscle pump and therefore the brain is deprived of oxygen and the brain therefore causes you to faint because by doing so it brings the head below the heart and that restores the blood flow. So the brain is, is highly protective of itself. It contains as Dominic mentioned, some 100 billion neurons, 100 billion nerve cells, uh, and these are connected by around about 180,000 kilometers of, of insulated cable, essentially what we call myelinated fibers. So it's quite a bit of kit. Uh, somebody once said, it's the, uh, somebody once told me it's the only general purpose computer in the world which runs on 25 watt on glucose and is turned out entirely by unskilled labor. Um, to which I replied, unskilled possibly, but I can assure you nine months, very hard labor. So where are memories stored? Well, there's a kind of a view about memory. I think there are two views, popular views about memory in popular <coughs> psychology. First of all, there is kind of one big memory store somewhere in the brain, like a filing cabinet, and things are done, dropped into it. In fact, that's not true. The brain, uh, let me, ha let me ha show you a, a model of the brain. we are. The brain. Don't do this at home, children. Uh, the brain has various storage areas. The brain has, for example, the prefrontal uh, lobes here. And this is where short-term memory is consolidated uh, in another region as well called the hippocampus. And if you lose your hippocampi, they're actually two, one each side, one on the left side, one on the right side of the brain, you are in very serious trouble. There is, in fact, a chap uh, uh, known, known to medical and psychological science as HM, and he has been studied for something like 25, 30 years by an American, a Canadian psychologist called Brenda Milner. And when he was a small boy, this unfortunate man, H.M., uh, was knocked down by a bicycle. I think he was about 11 when this happened. And shortly after he, thereafter, he developed epilepsy. 
and in order to control his epilepsy, uh, the surgeons operated on his brain and they removed the hippocampi from, from, the, from the brain uh, as part of other, other uh, organs which were removed within the brain. And this certainly cured his epilepsy, but it completely deprived him of any ability to consolidate memories. He lives constantly in the present. Brenda Milner has seen him three or four times a week for 30 years. Every time she comes into his room in the hospital, she has to say, hello, I'm Brenda Milner, I'm a psychologist, and I'd like to carry out some tests with you, because he has no memory at all. His memory span is round about a minute. And this is because the hippocampus, the hippocampi, have been removed, and he can, cannot consolidate what is happening into long-term memory. And finally, at the rear of the brain, here you have the cere cerebellum, the little brain, and this is uh, where we uh, store procedural skill memories. You learn to ride a bike, you learn to walk, uh, they'll be stored there. And boxers who become punch drunk do so because when the brain is, when the head is struck, the brain is knocked back against the skull and the cerebellum are, are, the cerebellum are damaged. And that's what causes people to become punch drunk. So essentially the brain stores memories all over the place. And if you were to suffer a stroke, um, it's quite likely the brain could recover the memories which have been lost because it's, it's, it's immensely adaptable. Now again, this idea that we have one, one memory, we, we don't. We have a whole range of memories. We have short-term memory and long-term memory. Short-term memory, as Dominic said in his presentation, has a capacity of round about seven bits of information. 1956, a psychologist called George Miller wrote a fascinating paper called The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 2 when he was talking about short-term memory. The magical number seven, because in our culture, seven is a magical number. Seven days of creation. The seventh son of a seventh son is supposed to have magical powers. There are a whole range in mythology uh, of sevens being very, very important. And you generally can remember seven pieces of information. Some people can remember nine pieces of information in short-term memory. Others can only remember five. So, hence, the magical number seven, plus or minus two. We have explicit, implicit memories. Explicit memories are memories we know about, memories we can say, yes, I, I, I remember that, or I, I, you're actually in your consciousness. Implicit memories are things which are lurking in the back of your mind and may well influence your behaviour, although you've no ac a direct access to, to them. So, for example, in our laboratory, we will show people our, our, on a computer screen words very briefly, <coughs> too briefly for them to actually see what the word is. But then when we go back the next day, we show them words with fragments of <coughs> words within them, fragments of letters. They will tend to find the words which they saw the day before. So this would be an implicit memory. Episodic memory for things, memories for our childhood, episodes in our childhood. Semantic memory, memory for, for words. Then there, then there are procedural memories, skills, playing tennis, playing, playing squash, swimming, cycling, whatever. Uh, prospective memory, this memory for future events. Uh, knowing that you've got an anniversary coming up, knowing that you're going to a meeting. And, th and the bad news here is that of all the areas of memory which psychologists like myself uh, have studied, this is the area which has received the least scientific attention. We really don't understand why some people have much better prospective memories than others. The best advice, and indeed vi ad advice which Dominic himself gives, is if you've got an appointment coming up, write it down. Write it in a, in a diary or write it on a calendar <coughs> in some way. That's by, sure the, by far the safest way. Uh, in fact, there's a Chinese saying, uh, apparently. I mean, everybody says they're Chinese sayings, which I'm sure don't really exist, but this is the palest ink is better than the best memory. And this is largely true for prospective memories. My advice would be to make a written note, particularly if it's a quite a long way in the future. Flashbulb memory. This is, everybody is said to remember the, where they were when, when President Kennedy was, uh, was assassinated. I mean, everybody who is uh, actually old enough to remember that. And so these things, suddenly, suddenly everybody probably remembers where they were where, when they heard about 9-11, for example. So you have these violently emotional events uh, which did develop flashbulb memory. Eidetic memory, this is often thought of as photographic memory. Children are very good at having eidetic memory. S some children have this, and I'll talk about this in a minute. And then you have uh, or tate or, or auditory, uh, hearing memories for what you hear, uh, memories for what you taste, memories for what you smell, memories for what you, the movements you make. And that's why if you're trying to find how to spell a, a, a word, what you very, very often do, suppose I ask you to spell the, uh, the word shillelagh, for example, which is an Irish cudgel normally made out of blackthorn or oak. Uh, what you would probably do would be to write it down, and you'd look at it and say, mm, shill, shall you try and think how you spell different sound, 
little phonemed in your mind. Now, there you'd be plugging to a number of memories. You'd be plugging to an, a sound memory, what it sounds like, a visual memory, what it looks like. You might write it down and say, well, that doesn't look a absolutely right. Uh, and you'd also be plugging into a muscle memory because your brain remembers the movements your hand has to make in order to write a word down. So you'd be using all those memories. And finally, there's cryptomnesia, which is unconscious plagiarism. Uh, it sometimes happens that somebody will produce a, a piece of poetry or a piece of prose. Uh, uh, it happened famously to a woman called Helen Keller, the, the, the woman who was blind and deaf and dumb. And she wrote a fantastic story. Uh, which was published, and had it, once it was published, it was shown that it, she, it had been published exactly the same, pretty much exactly the same, several years earlier. And um, she, was, she wasn't deliberately faking it. She actually had completely forgotten that she remembered that. Okay, so let me just close by looking at photographic memory. There is no such thing as photographic memory. The idea that you could look at something, uh, take a, some kind of flash photograph of it, but what is very similar to photographic memory is edidic memory. Uh, about 5 to 10% of children, young children, will have this memory. They can look at a picture, but they can close their eyes, and they can actually see the picture. Uh, actually, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a famous boy, uh, well, he'd be a man now, a, a savant, a somebody with very low levels of intelligence who actually has one particular skill, and he's an artist, and he can look at a building, like he can look at the Albert Hall, or perhaps you've seen documentaries about him, he can look at the skyline of Rome, and he can go back and write it down. Now, he clearly has a very powerful, edidic memory. Uh, it's a kind of a visual memory which you all possess, more powerful. Now, you can actually train yourself to some degree to do this. If you take a, a picture like this, and it's a very good way of training your memory, by the way, of developing a better visual memory. What you would do, you'd take a picture like that and you'd scan it. You'd scan it right to left, not left to right, right to left, across, like you're a scanner, a computer scanner scanning a document, and then go from bottom to top and try to, try to do it. And then do that for a minute or so and then turn the picture over or close your eyes and move away from it, and then see how much you can draw, and compare what you've drawn with what you actually saw. And you'll find with practice, your, your visual memory, your photographic or eidetic memory, uh, that's to say more precisely, will get better and better.